perhaps by necessity, we're led by technology. Technology is the driving force. The interesting question is, where is it going now? If we look at information, it's possible to regard it as being something that's technical. It's all about transistors. It used to be all about valves, and before that it was all about cogwheels. But really, information is about people. Uh, it's about sociology, it's about psychology, it's about politics. And as far as we're concerned, it doesn't matter what search engines you've got, what data sets you've got, unless you sort out the psychology, the sociology and the politics, you're going to get absolutely nowhere. But at this point in time... The, the notion of sort of authority and trust of the information has to be questioned. And in a way, you can go to the web um, to look for something. You'll find anything it is that you're looking for. Any opinion you want, you will find there somewhere. Any health problem you think you have or miracle cure you're looking for will be there. I think there's much stronger capacity of community now to say, no, I don't like this, to make ourselves known. And that's facilitated by technology. But it isn't the thing that we're aiming at. The thing we've got to be aiming at is humans. As what do we, what kind of society do we want? The big message that I think is, is coming out is that technology enables all kinds of things to be done that weren't possible before. Uh, that doesn't necessarily, it will be used for good. It can be, it's a, it's a two-edged sword, it can go either way. People, people will be using it for bad things as well as good things. Who's going to be in control of this immensely powerful thing? And, you know, our hope is, I suppose it... Perhaps I say I hope. Perhaps there is a hope that it will it will be balanced, that it will be transparent, that it will be a system that we can all participate in. It sounds very idealistic, but perhaps we have an opportunity to be idealistic in such a new technology. I just wanted to get some feedback from you how you think the type of impact the development of technology in the web has had on society, the current society at the moment. Is all information, or having lots of information, is that necessarily a good thing? There is an assumption that more information is a good thing, and I think that's what's pushed the technology. Technology has, has assumed that as long as there's more information, that is a, that's stated as a good thing. Of course it could be a good thing, but it has to have some sort of interface with some sort of review or process or expertise. Otherwise, we're going to be swamped with information and we really don't know, will that always be a good thing? There are examples where it is and examples where it isn't. So I think there are two different things going on. Um, now there's more information available. This is, this is a good thing because, for example, you can, you can get an un, unbiased or less biased view of, of uh, events or data or people um, by getting information from multiple sources and dealing with that. Now, this could be seen as a problem for which technology can help provide a solution because people are having to work with in a new way. Um, equally, you could see this as a change in how people are working and in how our, our brains are dealing with the information. Uh, and uh, if we look at how the next generation um, are using the internet and the web, um, it's just there, it's just part of their life and they seem to be multitasking spectacularly and time will tell and our social science colleagues are studying this carefully um, how well that's all working but perhaps uh, we have to remember it's not just about technology but it's about, it's about the cognition and what goes on in the brain as well I think we technologists are very good at providing information but the other half of the story is what that information does when it gets to your brain and how it affects behaviour We see technologies appearing and then we forget they ever weren't there like, like phones and mobile phones and now smartphones. There's a, there's a history of technology appearing in the past and us just then seeing it and it's just subsumed into normal life and we forget it's ever there and we just work with, with things as if they weren't there. There seems to be an inevitability about the increasing number of devices, be they uh, sensors in the environment or the devices that we're carrying with us. I mean, the number of devices we have around us in our house or in our car or in developing countries as well, uh, is, is just going up and up and up. So there is uh, clearly um, a digital world there that intersects with the physical world that we're in. And looking at the balance between the digital and the physical um, is, is very important. I mean, it's, it's often observed that, uh, for example, 
um, our children are living in a digital world and interacting with each other digitally where they used to interact physically. And some people say um, this is a bad thing because they should be out talking to each other. And other people say, no, actually, they weren't going to go out talking to each other anyway. This is much better because they're actually communicating with people. There's been a very long-standing debate about whether information should be free uh, at the point at which you use it, um, or whether we should pay for it. But we are in, at the moment, a phase where we've become frightened of paying for the very food that drives our lives. It's as if we want to go to supermarkets and take everything off the shelves and not pay for it. Uh, we want to go to the information supermarket, take everything off and not pay for it. And we pay the price for that in the ladling of information to us in a rather unstructured form in ways that don't necessarily give us what we want. I heard a, a very interesting opinion piece recently and the person was talking about the rise of uh, radio when it first appeared. And people weren't making money from it. So the question of whether you should pay for it or whether you shouldn't pay for it, whether it's free or not, isn't the question is, is people had a perception that it was free because they could just turn on their radio and it was free. Information is never actually free. The question is who is paying for it. If the advertiser is paying for it, they expect it to fit their agenda. If government is paying for it, it fits the government agenda. Sponsors may be paying for it and we don't even know that they're paying for it. And this makes information really rather sinister because we don't know actually whose agenda is being served by its provision to us. I suspect the web is simply a reflection of human nature. There will be social and cultural interactions which are rewarding outside of money. That there will be reward associated with them if you feel you're doing something beneficial for society. Um, there are plenty of people who work on the premise that as long as they can get by, they want to work for the benefit of others. I think that's self-evident. There will be a reward. It won't always be money. But I do think underneath a lot of the free, there's also layers of, of, of business. It's naive to assume that the web is neutral. Uh, the web is already being taken over. Uh, it may be taken over by people that we're comfortable with. You might be comfortable with your whole life being owned by Google, uh, by them having the right to determine who looks at that and who doesn't. Um, it's quite clear that the American government uh, would just love to filter everything that goes through the web uh, including all of the queries. It's totally uh, obvious that the British government earnestly desires to do exactly the same thing and that the big providers are already fitting in with that. Uh, the notion of providers logging every call that we make onto the internet uh, is already with us. Now, you could take a benign view and say this is simply here for our protection. Um, you could take the view that throughout the whole of history uh, if there has been a resource that could be exploited by the few against the interests of the many, that exploitation will take place. Uh, and I think this is the underlying fear, uh, that it is possible to subvert the web, and if it's possible, lots of people are going to try. So that our view of the real world from China becomes different to our view of the real world from America, because we are filtered in the information. The great thing is, that's always been the case. It predates, by thousands of years, the internet. In World War II, um, it was regarded as vital to the country that the whole of the information system was subverted and we were given a positive view in order to keep spirits up. Now, that's no different whatever uh, to the idea of government subverting the web now. So we don't need to fear that the web has brought something new to our lives. Technology has merely found a new way uh, of working with the kinds of centrist forces which society has had for all time. The internet was designed so that anything can connect up with anything and talk in any way they want, basically. Um, what's happened with up to now is the, uh, the internet has worked, which is the backbone on which the web sits, is that things have just gone through in little packets of information, so they're actually called packets. And the, all the, the nodes, the, the, if you like, stations through which that information passes, 
have been blind as to what those are. They've just passed the information on, and all they've worried about is where the information is coming from, where is it going to. What people are doing now, ISPs particularly, are thinking about looking at those data packets and going, is it a video from somebody who I like, who's paying me something, and speeding that one up, and keeping other data packets in the way. One of the concerns at the moment is um, because the sort of central, if there is a central control on the internet or the regulation is in the US, um, and this irks a number of countries, China particularly wants more representation in that, how, you know, there is some suggestion that it might seed its own internet, uh, completely seal itself off and have its own nationwide intranet, if you like. Now that would be a bad thing. If we start seeding, we're losing the internet. We're beginning to make sort of nodes and focuses that are not communicating with each other. So I think it's upon us to keep whatever our opinions, uh, uh, whatever our political starts, to keep that interconnectivity. Because it's that that allows this democratization, it's that that allows you to communicate across those areas. Value and impact on society that we've been discussing results from the, the, the sharing of information that's provided by the internet and the web. As soon as you partition that in any way and reduce that sharing, then it, it damages that value. It could be a death of a thousand cuts. As in, you know, very slowly certain things are eroded for beneficial, and there may actually be beneficial reasons. We have to keep an eye out that the net effect isn't to drift towards non-transparency and issues where there's no accountability. Just like a political system or a legal system, there has to be some accountability, there has to be transparency in the system. I think the information tide will turn and we will stop developing in that direction because we'll simply get fed up with it and realise it's absorbing far too much of society's effort. We think this flood inevitably will increase exponentially forever, but it won't. We'll get sick of information and we'll start realising that there is creativity, there is sharing, there is socialising, there is moralising. There are vastly better things to do with the world's resources than coat every environment in sensors, every tree in surveillance cameras, uh, and then have three quarters of the population analysing the results. Not a future. I think the tide will turn. You could step back or up and look at the whole, the whole planet. Um, there are little bits where we, we've instrumented it. There are sensor networks, there are places where we're getting some data. As, as Craig said, there are places where there's a little and there's places where there's an awful lot. And it seems entirely clear to me that that trend is going to increase and that we're going to be able to get information about anywhere on the planet in all sorts of forms. Um, the challenge, <laughs> then, is to be able to deal with that and to do the things that we've been discussing in terms of providing our human beings um, with the information they want in the form that they want that makes it very easy to use to make the decisions they want to use. Uh, the very exciting opportunity that comes out of that is linking up things, uh, linking up information to, to, to understand things that absolutely couldn't be done before. So, but, so by bringing information together, uh, we have something very, very new. And I think that absolutely uh, is, is the new opportunity here. We have lots of, lots of um, challenges and threats, but the opportunity here is to get new insights into what's going on at planetary scale right down to a, you know, a micro scale based on this, on this data. And the challenge for the computer scientists is to use technologies like Semantic Web to link that up and technologies like Web2 in order to make that uh, accessible and to empower scientists and, and researchers and users of the information and the citizen uh, to, to, to use that uh, to, to make their lives better. I think if we're looking at the role of the internet in improving decision making, We've got two aspects. One is the nature of information and the other is the nature of decision. And both are very complex issues. And I think we have to regard expertise as something very precious. What else are we creating universities for if it isn't to produce people with expertise? Yet we've run frightened of the expert and we're hiding behind information. And the trouble with information is that we don't believe in it. And there is very little research to show that information improves decisions, and a great deal of research that suggests it doesn't. 
if you go to the duty-free shop and look at the cigarettes, you'll see piles of boxes that says, smoking kills. That is information. And you'll see people taking the boxes and buying them. That is the decision which ignores the information. And the psychology and the sociology which disconnects us from information is so complex that we have got to invest in research on that aspect of society, not just on more and more raw computing power.